two minutes. And when you came in the resort, you had like a, a pool with floating um, uh, sauce packages, as you can see hopefully. I don't know if it's too far. Um, and there were like grand activities like yoga, um, live uh, performances, etc. So you were all into the brand for like two or three days. And that's crazy. And I think this is a nice yeah, example to see experience all you are. So you can uh, look it up online. Uh, let's see. Again, I think everything goes well. No. Yeah. So the next category, PR. I think a lot of things has, have been said about this campaign. And I think a lot of people in this talk will talk about it also, but I still want to say something about it. Um, this was a campaign that we thought was awesome. And um, that's really because we thought the execution was very good. They did research from the get-go. So they choose the right influencer uh, that really connected with the target group. And they um, yeah, included the influencer, so Snella in this case, uh, in, the, the, in the creative process. So you get a really synergetic campaign that's really hitting the nail on the head. So that's something we really liked about this campaign. And I don't know if you can see it, yeah. I think um, uh, our, my fellow speakers are going to tell you something more about it. And uh, I will have to say, check if I'm um, forgetting something. No. Um, at last, I would like to tell you something more about PR in general. So I want to conclude with the ingredient of a creative PR idea. So next to solving the brief, that's of course really important. We think these steps are also very important. Um, one, and I have that also here. Spices. So you can add ingredients that are uncommon or that are really not fitting the the. the or something, I hear something, I think there's a bell that I have to rub it up, I don't know. Um, so, we missed um, a little bit at the Smart Relief campaign. So, it's well executed, but it's still quite logical. So, um, that's why we didn't reward it with a golden lamp. The uh, one, it adds value to the larger consumer, so we want to add value on different levels, so you can you know, put a smile on everybody's face, but you can also make the work. There are many levels of doing that. Uh, both of the campaigns have that. Um, although with Memorials of Amsterdam, the reach wasn't very clear. So that's something, um, yeah. Maybe if that was clear enough, it would also be a contestant for the golden lamp. Um, and the third one, it's current. So, uh, do you need to into the energy of that moment? So that can be a state of mind, uh, undercurrent, some trends. And we mm -hmm. think that one is a big yes for both winners, actually. Um, and I have a last tip from a PR point of view. So if you created a really nice campaign, it would be a terrible waste if not if you don't um, put some PR power behind it because uh, that can make a great campaign into, turn it into a fantastic campaign and it will really broaden your reach. So, um, yeah, I think that's my last tip for now. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I told you a little bit more about the decision-making process and um, uh, I, will leave you, I will leave you guys to it. Um, and if you want to know more about PR or <coughs> Gen Z or diversity in, in general, yeah. You can hit me up and uh, Dinesh, I think uh, he will take it away from here. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank Absolutely, you guys. thank and, you. Uh, yeah, enjoy your lunch. Thanks a lot, Melanie. Yeah. Thanks for joining us and sharing uh, these insights. Um, oh, wait, I have a last philosophical slide. Sure. Yeah, this one. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Next up um, in the lineup is uh, the executive creative director at Boomerang Creative Agency. Uh, his name is Rico de Lange, 
he was a member of the um, jury for uh, social influencer and digital advertising. Um, so we'd love to welcome him um, to the show. Have a seat on the sofa. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks again for um, having been on the jury. Um, first question obviously relates to the social influencer category. So yeah. what can you share some of the takeaways, outtakes from the jury discussions with us? Um, well, I think one of the big winners of this year's uh, award was uh, Smart Leap um, by uh, Snelle and uh, Interpolis uh, created by uh, WeFilm. Um, personally, I think this is one of the best things I've seen in a long time. And I know the first time that I saw the video, it gave me goosebumps, to be honest. I think it was so, it was really, really solid. And still now, when I heard a song on the radio, it reminds me of the video, especially the part in the end, still goosebumps every time. So um, big compliments to the team that worked on that. Um, based on the influence that I used, I think our key outtake was that it's not the first time that a campaign uses a Dutch hip hop artist, mm -hmm. but I think it's one of the first time that I actually believed that person. I think they did a really good job in finding the right person for this uh, message. I feel that Snelle is a person that really endorses the message that Interpolis uh, wanted to deliver and that he used his talent and his, his reach to deliver that message to, to a young audience that also listens to his music. So, and therefore, I think it was a perfect fit for the audience. Um, I also feel that the way they did it was super relatable. Um, I actually can remember my first love, my high school crush. I think everybody can. Um, I actually also was a little bit scared of her father, just like Snelle mm -hmm. sings in a song. Uh, so it's very relatable for people, which, which makes us a really standout, uh, standout uh, campaign. Um, in fact, our jury outcome was that this specific campaign, I think, sets a new, um, raises the bar of what a influencer campaign should be in the future. From now on, a brief on influencer campaign would be, can we create something like Smart Leap? So good luck to all the creatives to work on that. <laughs> um, so, but it's authenticity and believability that, that is re uh, really important, um, in my opinion. And if you look at other uh, influencer campaign that were in the category like, um, Flesse with Fiesse, um, with Fiesse Fur, also a Dutch hip hop artist. Um, so I see a pattern there. Um, but what what they did there, uh, Albert Hein and, and Fiesse, is that um, first of all, I think it it really takes balls for a for a brand to work with such a unique and outspoken character. But um, just let him do his thing keeping it real, don't try to change it, because that's his strength, and that's why it, it also, why he can deliver the message they want to deliver to the audience. Um, so lesson learned is there is don't try to change the authenticity of an influencer, but just keep it real. Um, next to the right influencer for your story, I think it's also important that you have a solid, legit story. Uh, for influencer to to really take a stand and really mm -hmm. to endorse it. So, if you look at the campaign um, uh, victim fashion, I think what they did there was really smart and and solid that they invited fashion influencers and showed them a story that actually uh, touched them in order for them to share that message because uh, after seeing it they find it very important and want to use 
their reach to, to spread the importance of that, that story. Yeah. Clear? Thanks a lot. One more question on the goosebumps. Yeah. What exactly triggered the, the goosebumps? Because I think that's the kind of emotions that we all try to end, reach. It was the end, like the, the end, the twist in the story. In the story that you think like, damn. It's, it's almost a little bit like Eminem with Stan. They, in the end, you find out, oh, it's the same guy. And it was also, you're building up to a moment and then they can bam, in your face. Yeah. yeah that really hit hard. Hit hard. Yeah. yeah. All right, then the, to the second category, you judged uh, digital, so that's yeah. all types of digital advertising yeah. uh, content. Yeah. Um, what work did you like and why specifically did you um, like it as a jury? It's the IKEA um, audio catalog. Um, just the other day, I was uh, playing Trivial Pursuit, um, and I learned in, during that game that the IKEA catalog used to be the most distributed uh, book in the world, even more than the Bible. Um, I didn't get the question right, though. Uh, I did win the game. What was your answer? Uh, I think I gave another re religious kind of book, but I, I can't remember, but I never came up with IKEA. Uh, but I think that was the old days, because now uh, the IKEA catalog is digital. Yeah. And the brief that, um, that was really... Uh, 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 the base for this project was how can we um, promote the digital version of the IKEA catalog. Mm -hmm. And um, what they did there is that they created an audio version of, of it. And when I first heard the idea, I think it was so original and fun, it's new and fresh. I said to my fellow jury members, um, I wish I was part of that specific brainstorm with some of that, those guys or girls in a room. And I don't have to come up with an idea, but if someone drops the idea, okay, let's do the full catalog and let someone read it out loud on the podcast, you're first like, what the fuck? But second, you're like, yes, let's do this. This is so good. Uh, and that's what I like. That's what I like in general, that brands and creators try to change a certain way of how a medium or a channel or uh, a device is being used and turn it in, into something new. And I think they did a really good job in that. Um, next to the fact that it started digital, it also got picked up by PR, created a lot of earned media. It even, uh, I think, went up to the top listen podcasts uh, in that period of time. And it, like, the track lasts forever. So. Really good job on that, and that was one of my personal favorites in the, in the digital category. All right, thanks. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, from you, the viewer, please let us know, either right now in the comments section, but you can also always email awards at adcn.nl. I will try to, um, um, to send your questions about feedback to your work uh, to the juries, um, and make sure that you get a response so that you learn from the feedback. Um, one more, one two more questions to you. So in the space of social and digital, in your view, yeah. particularly in your work at Boomerang, but also maybe in the jury's point of view, what constitutes a great idea in that space? Well, what does it do? What is it made of? Like for me, I think a lot of creatives, almost any creative in our industry came up with a good idea. The trick is to translate it into a great idea, and I think, and it might sound like an open door, but I think it's mainly in the execution part. Um, for a good idea to become a great idea, you need to know how you should deliver that idea to your audience. Um, for that, as a, a brand manager and marketer or creator, you need to know how your consumers consume their content on social platforms or devices. Mm -hmm in order to create specific content that are fit for platform. Because every platform and every channel should deserve a different approach because they are consumed differently. Yeah. And still nowadays we see brands putting TVCs on social channels. And I think we should take a stand and say, let's don't put any horizontal videos on vertical devices anymore because it doesn't make sense. No. 
And what's your, so is that your main piece of advice also to clients and also to um, if you get a briefing that actually doesn't match the channel or the format in social digital, what, you know, how would you rewrite that brief? I think what we try to do is take a pretty wide approach. So if you're going to write a script uh, in order to create a TVC, make sure you rewrite the script in order to make it work on social and make sure if you shoot that script to get everything out of it in order to create all kind of assets in the end. Because it's really hard to uh, create a social asset out of a TVC and also the other way around. So you need to think about that up front. All right. Thank you so much, Rico, for uh, being here today with us and um, sharing some feedback from the juries. And uh, we hope to see you soon back at the club. Um, next up, um, we've got Raj Nadal. She's the creative director at Iris Amsterdam. And she was, for the second year in a row, a member of the advertising jury that judged no less than five categories so it's direct, radio, integrated print and outdoor, outdoor right? Yes, yeah. that's so right. welcome Rajna, yeah. thanks for joining. Hey, thanks for having me here. <laughs> um, so how did this year, how was this year different from last year? Both as, you know, in terms of the type of jury discussions, considerations, but especially also the work. Well, one thing that really, really struck out to me this year was that uh, specifically looking at local Dutch advertising, there is a real shift around advertising that's beginning to sort of look at communication through the lens of culture, which was the decisive shift that I saw this year in most of the work. Mm -hmm. In fact, funnily enough, that we were a traditional jury, right? We, we were doing all the categories you just mentioned, like the print and the outdoor and the radios of the world. But the real conversations, the richer conversations were happening around advertising that actually doesn't feel like advertising you know, is finding new ways to connect with the consumer. And that's what really, really excited everybody, even in these categories. Mm -hmm. And also as a result of which, what are the roles of these channels now in this new world that we live in, where the, 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 you know, the lines between traditional advertising and content is so blurred, uh, more blurred than ever. And why is it so important to um, be more part of culture rather than um, be clear about that it's marketing or advertising after all? I've got something for you. I think it's because of this. I genuinely believe whether we sitting in the advertising agencies like it or we don't, everybody is looking at ads with an ad blocker on. It doesn't just exist in our browsers. That's the way with all the content that we, that's thrown and coming our way, we have an ad blocker on. But when we take that ad blocker out or when we sort of start having conversations, whether it's for an idea, a product, a service or a cause, when you start having conversations but genuinely connect to people, I think that's when, that's when the penny drops in, in people's heads, you know, or their hearts for that matter. And that's when it really, really starts to work. That's where the magic happens. So all the science and the gut, all the magic and the logic, I believe, starts to come together when the lens of culture is used. And that's what was so different about the work this year for me. You know, and, and it's almost a year, it, 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 it has been a very big year. And most of the work that was created was post pandemic as well. Mm -hmm. But even then the, sh the shift towards purpose driven advertising or just the world at large, the conversations people are beginning to have, um, whether it's on uh, social media or in news is really, really affecting how people are consuming and how they are reacting to brands even. And I think that's why I think being a part of culture I think has had a decisive shift. In fact, brands like even um, Burger King globally have made a really, really big impact. The CMO spoke about the fact that how they really want to build a brand that moves at the speed of culture. And you see that in the work that they're beginning to create. And that was what's exciting to see for me. And what do you think, what do we need to do? So being brand managers, marketers, creative agencies, how can we learn or to, to do that better, to use, to apply the cultural lens, what's needed in terms of a skill or a mindset uh, to make that happen? I think the Im most important thing is to sort of have, a, have your finger on the pulse of culture. And that could happen in many different ways, you know. You know, when you're under understanding the target audience, how they're consuming the media, what is the message that you want to and targeting them. 
I mean, the digital communication allows us with so much measurability, the data that we have and how we use it. But instead of letting it inform our decisions, let's use that to actually inform our gut and instinct, yeah. you know, to create that. And then working with culture, because another thing about culture is, it's obsolete every three seconds or even faster, as some of the people might tell you, you know? So you really need to, be, uh, need to understand what's relevant today and be able to be able to react to it. And even more importantly, understand if you actually genuinely have a role to play in that culture as well. So it's not just about, that's the zeitgeist and let me tap into it. It's also about understanding, do I have a right or a permission mm -hmm. as a brand to actually be having this conversation? So that's what I would look at. So which work actually um, displayed that um, cultural sensitivity or being part of culture and how did that work inspire you and the jury? Yeah, I'm going to talk about three pieces of work. One has already been spoken about, but I think it needs to be spoken about again through the lens of culture. I think one of the most interesting campaigns for me was uh, Don't Let Brexit Come in, come in the Way, the, the blue Brexit monster. Interestingly, when you talk about understand, I mean, understanding how a really genuinely interesting idea reaches ears and hearts and minds, I mean, it wasn't just covered in The Guardian or The New York. I actually read about it in The Times of India. It has no reason to be spoken about in Times of India, and I actually read about it there. I think just the fact that it tapped into the zeitgeist in a way that I've been very rarely seen work to. And everybody was not just talking about the fact, nobody really understand what Brexit is. It's, is it a blue furry monster or something else? But actually using that, and then starting it, and instead of sort of finding a way to, you know, sort of finding a digital sort of st strategy, seeding strategy around it, it started and ended with one tweet by the foreign minister mm -hmm. featuring him. And that was like ge genius, I thought. And yeah, that was, uh, again, I think tapping into the Zeitgeist, making news and conversation, yeah. and also about the whole world, look at the Dutch, look at how they're doing Brexit, was, 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 was really, really great. It was, uh, it was much talked about. Um, the other piece of work uh, which, again, spoke to me was, um, uh, was in the integrated, a lot of discussion around it, it was Dewey's Leaf, which was just introducing a word into common parlance. <coughs> You know, it is not easy. It is a very, very ambitious idea for an agency to say, we are going to take unkind online behavior by introducing a new word. And they actually made it work. You know, people were actually using it. And, and I just thought that was really, really, it, and it's a very important thing as well, you know. I mean, when you talk about purpose-driven advertising, everybody's trying to do certain set of things. It's climate, or is it this or that? I think they've taken a cause which actually nobody is talking about, which is unki uh, unkind online behavior, and done something about it, which I thought was very powerful as well, and it worked. All right. And the last piece the of work yeah. Yeah, was, uh, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about it. It's uh, small relief, but I really, really wanted to sort of mention that, because that, to me, epitomized how you, know, you can make culture work for you, in a way. To me, it was exactly with the kind of work or communication I have grown up with, which is very Bollywood. Yeah. So hats off for that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for um, sharing this. And um, yeah, I'll take this with me. Take, please take the ad blocker with <laughs> you. We can't Cheers. have too much of that. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll continue with the next uh, category, which actually is the film advertising category. And um, we'll do that with uh, the creative art director at Wine and Kennedy. She was a member of this year's film jury. Um, so please welcome Anya Dev. Hi, welcome. <laughs> thank you. So thanks again for being part of this year's uh, jury. Yeah. Um, we're curious um, to learn your point of view, but also the jury's point of view on yeah. what makes a great idea in the context of film mm -hmm. advertising. Mm -hmm. How would you um, yeah, describe the qualities that as a jury you've been looking for? Well, you know, I think we're living in this world, and I, I just want to emphasize before we, we go into this, is um, we're living in a time where we're seeing a split and a shift in advertising as well as like the industry space in terms of like the, uh, the talent that we're seeing that's creating the kind of work and as well as the, the people who are judging it or like the leadership and the mentorship. And we're, it's very interesting because we're seeing this young crop of individuals who are recently coming in and kind of shifting and changing the advertising scene, bringing in diverse 
points of views, mm -hmm. bringing in, um, you know, I mean, they live in the social media era. So it's, it's a completely different kind of content that they're consuming and engaging with. And then we're also seeing the mentorship and leadership coming from a more traditional space. So I feel like it was a very interesting jury panel in the sense that it was a little bit um, split, but in a very good way. Like we had two kinds of different points of views. Um, so that was interesting. I mean, me personally, I was looking for work that had truth and work that made me feel something and work mm -hmm. that kind of was relevant in the space that we're operating in today. Um, and I feel like as a jury in, in, you know, in total, we were kind of looking for that work, something that made us feel uh, like we were personally part of that part of that narrative or that story. And I think that's why storytelling is so important and crucial. And I mean, it comes back to the whole conversations that we're having surrounding diversity today. Um, it's so important to bring in people who can tell a different narrative or people who have a different story to tell. We've seen the stories and the narratives of a similar kind of person for so long in advertising and in film in general. Um, I think that's how we're, that's that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a fresh perspective, and that can only come with diversity and inclusion. Yeah. And how does it translate to film those diverse perspectives? So, how do you, um, um, as a filmmaker, yeah. as a creative, as a brand, how you display mm -hmm. um, those exact qualities? Well, you know, when you have people coming in um, who have different life experiences, okay. who've gone through different things in life, and whose culture is completely different than who we already have in the building, I think that changes the narrative. And that changes the kind of place where ideas are coming from. Yeah. It changes the kind of art direction that you see. It changes the kind of writing that you experience. It comes from a, a different emotional sensibility. And that's where you get really interesting work that, that resonates with so many people, you know, that has that human truth of, of a varied form of um, experiences and stories. Because at the end of the day, all our creativity comes from like a super, super personal space. Like as much as we say that this is work and, you know, our pleasures and our personal life is separate, as a creative, you're always in, those things are always interlinked. And I think that's why it's so important to bring in people um, from diverse spaces so that they can seep into the stories that we eventually see on, in film. Yeah. So, so which work that you awarded or that you judged um, yeah, showed that those examples of yeah. truthness and, and the humanity in the mm -hmm. work, can you give an example? Um, yeah, I think one of our Bronze Winners Plus mm -hmm. uh, did that really beautifully in the sense that it told the story of black joy and like a beautiful black couple. And I think that that's so important because we haven't seen those faces being represented. And I think that that, um, you know, a lot of people can, can resonate and relate to that. And I think th that's what was so beautiful and um, well depicted about it. I don't know if the creative team working on it was were people of color. I hope they were, but I think that's why that's why we need to bring them in. That's why yeah. because I think I, those kinds of environments then lead to really really authentic and beautiful stories and truths about joy, about happiness, about pain, about grief, and that's where we can really elevate filmmaking to really storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at all the work you judged, um, over 50 films, is there, what could we improve in Dutch film advertising? So what maybe was missing or lacking or what could have made those films yeah. uh, better um, and more impactful? Um, I think risk taking. Um, I think that's something that, you know, we, we just don't, there's so little of it now because I think you've got 30 seconds, you've got all these messaging, all this message that you want to you wanna get across and you have to do it in mm -hmm. 30 seconds and um, we make it so much about the product, uh, which is really, really important. The product has to be the heart and soul of it, but I think taking risks and big leaps in the way that we tell our truths, I think that will really elevate um, f the way we see film in advertising and I don't mean risk 
equals to racial diversity like I've been talking about, mm -hmm. you know, because I, 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 don't, I don't see that as a risk. I see no. it as a blessing. Yeah. And I think that the things that we've been afraid to do, we need to do them. We need to, we need to be able to step out of like, in terms of art direction, the, the things that we've been taught, you yeah. know, the like things that we think are premium, the cost that we think is going to be aspirational. Yeah. I think we just need to experiment more and be a bit braver. I see this with, the cl with clients a lot. Like I see that clients hold a certain piece of work up to a very high standard but then find it too risky to do that same kind of piece of work. So I think doing that kind of work that makes you feel a bit scared yeah. and um, a bit excited, I think that's where we need to be. And how do you convince your clients to go for that? So what does right. it take to bring <laughs> them in that space of um, comfort about being discomfortable? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with client relationships. Like, what kind of clients do you want to work for? Like, what do you want to ultimately stand for within the agency? So that's like more of an internal and structural kind of, you know, environment that you want to breed. But then it's also about building a relationship with your clients where you, um, where your friends, where they, where they can trust you. You build that kind of trust um, in the work that you do and the way that you, that you convince them to do it. I think it's, it's a partnership. And I think the moment you start seeing it as like a beautiful friendship or something that you're building together, um, I think that's where the trust kind of comes in. All right, wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, being with us today. Yeah. We're grateful that, we are, that you were on the jury. And um, yeah, let's hope yeah. Uh, everybody will take these lessons forward in creating brilliant uh, films. Thank you so very thanks much. Thanks a lot, Anya. Yeah. Thank you. All right, now finally we'll um, hear from um, one of this year's winners um, uh, across multiple advertising categories, in fact, across a lot of other uh, creative categories. Um, we'll talk to Bas Welling, co-founder and managing director of WeFilm, who created together with the client Interpolis, Snell and all kinds of partners, the wonderful project Small Leaves, which took multiple lamps, about six of them, plus the Grand Prix. So huge congratulations again, boss, to you and the team. Um, thanks, you and, and, and thanks for, for all this recognition for the work and uh, for, the, for the whole team. We were really, really surprised last week by also the, the little celebration you guys organized uh, uh, nearby our office where, where Snelle himself uh, presented us the Grand Prix. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah, well, it was all well-deserved. Um, so what we try to do is we try to uncover a little bit how this project came together and what were the essential ingredients, the steps taken to uh, yeah, deliver, deliver this, this wonderful piece of work. Um, so let's start at the beginning. How, what was the original client brief or the problem statement? Yeah, so uh, for quite some time, for quite some years already, Interpolis is, is, is looking in how can we add value on, on mobility in, uh, in general. Uh, and more specifically on uh, those fields where att attention flows away from, uh, from, from mobility itself. So uh, some time ago we did a project uh, around uh, smartphone usage in the car mm -hmm. and there Interpolis uh, introduced an app, it was called the Automodus app and what you saw as a result is that uh, uh, um, people who used the Automodus app on average uh, their, uh, the, 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 the number of of accidents, casualties, uh, yeah. uh, casualties the, the, the cost of damage decreased by 20% as a result of people who used this, uh, this app. Yeah. So in this case we were looking into uh, another problem and that's the problem of young people using their smartphone on the bike. And actually uh, it's nothing new that a lot of young people are quite addicted to their phone. And the main point is that also they, they don't feel that there's any risk involved with using the phone while biking. Uh, while in reality uh, they are of course distracted, they show unsafe behavior on the bike so, and, and the number of damages is, is increasing every year even though there is a law and there is a fine, mm -hmm. uh, you see it uh, increasing every year. So the main brief was uh, can we really, uh, can, can creativity help to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to decrease the, the, this issue? And uh, knowing that uh, offering them a tool, a technological tool such as an app would help, huh? if, you, if you know this, uh, this experience from, 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 from the car users, and also knowing that when young people grow 
older and when they become car drivers, that we also know that this behavior on the bike will be translated Take to the forward, car and yeah. then the risk involved will be even higher. Yeah. So this was main, uh, the main brief. It's quite a, a, a heavy uh, target audience to, to do something with, but can we, can, can we use creativity yeah. to, to add value here? Yeah. So I think the starting point was also to dive into research um, yeah. with the entire team. So what, was your, what were the key insights that, that came out from that research? Like why exactly do they feel confident in using the phone um, uh, in traffic? So why do they, do they sort of underestimate the risks uh, being associated with that behavior? Yeah, yeah. So, so what we learned is to dive directly into creativity or into ideas won't do the trick. Huh? First, what we do is uh, to, to, to try to understand it on a psychological level, what, what happens here? Mm -hmm. And also what barriers should be overcome that we can really do something to this problem. And we saw a few interesting things. So first thing we saw is that uh, facts coming from adults or institutions uh, won't have any impact. Even if they come from a government or from adults or even from an insurance company, if you just tell them the facts, it won't influence their behavior. What we also saw is that, um, that peers are really important. So if a friend tells you something, they're really uh, carefully listening. Mm -hmm. uh, so relatable stories from, from people in the same life uh, uh, period, life stage, Lifestyle, life stage. Um, will, and that's where, where the, 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 the link is mixed to, 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 to culture. Right? You should yeah. dive into their, their culture to do something. And then of course the point of influence has come by, but uh, also this research showed that actually young people are quite uh, uh, skeptical about, about the link between influences and brands. It should be a, a, a very good fit, authentic, uh, in an authentic way. And if influencers are doing something because of the brand telling them uh, it, then it's also kind of uh, fast rejected. And the last thing that came out of research, which actually surprises us a bit, was that um, um, it should, if you would try, if you would like to to change behavior uh, in this field, you should really um, be becoming topic on the dining table between parents and children. Uh, so parents telling them not to do it doesn't work but having uh, conversations on the same level does work. So that created the, let's say, debrief and creative brief where we said, okay, the thing we have to create should dive into the culture of uh, young people. We also saw that YouTube and Instagram are the two platforms where we had the highest uh, chance of making an impact, but at the same time also create a, uh, an impact on adults and on their parents because it should be topic on the, on the dining table, literally. Yeah. So when and why did you um, uh, go for the collaboration with Snell? Yeah, so, so from this point on we thought, okay, we need to find a true authentic match. Uh, we knew that uh, hip hop culture was something these young people, especially on the bike with Spotify and things, are, are really, uh, that, they're really, that they're really living. And it was an interesting point, I think a bit more than a year ago when we were looking for the right person to, to carry out this message. Uh, talking to, to different people. At that moment, uh, the management of Snelle sent, uh, sent to us the, the demo of the Réunie, uh, the first number one hit. Mm -hmm. At that moment, it wasn't out yet. Uh, so they, they sent it to us and told, hey, this is going to be out in, in one or two months. Listen to it because maybe this is a match. We also, d uh, uh, we were looking for a, for, for a talent, upcoming talent to work with. And we heard the reunion and thought, wow, this is, this is also a really personal story about his, his childhood, about his, 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 his uh, personal uh, circumstances. Uh, so from that moment on, we started to, uh, to, to work with him. And um, I think one of the critical points was that uh, we really would like to inspire him with the story of young people. So, but instead of uh, looking around for young people ourselves, we thought there should also be an authentic match between those young people and our, and our, <coughs> and our um, talent. So we asked him to, 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 do, to <coughs> write an in, uh, Instagram post and say, hey, I'm going to write a, num uh, a song about this. Um, who has got any experience in his personal uh, situation with this? And would you like to tell your story to me? And uh, some hundreds of uh, replies followed and we did some screening on that. And there we got to this one day where 10 to 12 young people told their life story um, uh, where, uh, well, where a phone on a bike uh, uh, dramatically changed their life, uh, their life, told them to, to snelle. And that evening he started to write a song and actually the, the, the chorus was already uh, written on that evening. Wow. 
All right, final question. What is your biggest or most important personal learning from this project, creatively or otherwise? Um, well, uh, I think um, Interpolis in this case had the guts to, to really use their uh, societal role to say, hey, we're not going to, to tell everyone we are, do really care about this or we're not going to tell about our role in this. Mm -hmm. We are going to use our power to, to let creativity do the work on the topic itself. So I think one of my main outtakes is creativity can have a, have a, have a, have a true impact on big societal issues as long as we give uh, the freedom to, uh, to creativity. Yeah. In this case, to Snelle, to the filmmakers, to, to the whole creative process. Um, Interpolis did not, at, at, in the whole creative uh, process of Snelle, for example, did, didn't, didn't interfere at all. Let them do the complete trick trick and that's where words like authenticity come from because there was no interference and it was his own story yeah. and it was he was telling about his own uh, youth yeah. but the power of creativity on big societal uh, things and well we live in times where we have some uh, shouldn't be underestimated and that makes it really nice to to work in these yeah. times and this field and also to be recognized with uh, a campaign like this uh, by uh, such a such a great jury all right, thanks a lot, Bas, for uh, joining. We look forward to see what's next uh, coming from WeFilm, also what Interpolis will do to um, yeah, take, this, uh, take the development of solutions to these challenges to the next level again. Um, again, con congratulations on behalf of many juries and the team here. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the inspiration uh, with S'more for Leaf. Thanks again. All right, um, so this is it for, um, uh, for today. We'll... Um, um, We'll be back uh, tomorrow at 12.30 uh, with the design juries. Some of the speakers include Lauren van der Kolk, uh, design director at Asian Tate, Alex Normanton, uh, creative director at Design Bridge, as well as Lisa Enebuis, um, one of the ADCN board members, um, one of the big winners in design uh, this year with the demo project. Meanwhile, if you want more inspiration, please visit the gallery at adcn.nl slash awards, where you can see all the nominated work learn from the briefings, all of the ideas, the personal learnings from all the teams and agencies who've been working on those projects, um, over 140 of them. And we encourage you to um, also look for work behind the category or behind the discipline in which you work yourself. So try maybe to find inspiration elsewhere. Um, thanks again for joining. We'll be back tomorrow and um, have a great day.